Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Institute for Rebooting Social Media's uh, fall speaker series. Um, today, we have Combating Misinformation Through Digital Markets. My name is Shelby Elitmani. I'm a program coordinator for the Institute, and I'm pleased to introduce you all today to today's speaker, Mar Marshall Van Alston. Professor Van Alston is the Questrom Chair of Information Systems at Boston University and a digital fellow at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. His work explores how information and communications technology affects firms, innovation, and society with an emphasis on multi-sided platforms. He is co-author of the international bestseller, Platform Revolution, and has made significant contributions to information economics and strategy as co-developer of the theory of two-sided markets. He is also a current visiting scholar here at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Please join me in welcoming Professor Van Alston. Well, let me say thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to make this a conversation because I think personally, the misinformation problem is one of the defining problems of our day. I mean, I don't think we can solve any problem if we can't agree on the basic facts. Who, you know, whether the president is legitimate or not, whether vaccines work or not, whether the planet is heating or not. If we can't agree on facts, then we're really, really not going to be able to solve the problems. Misinformation is an old problem. There are stone frescoes lying about the accomplishments of Babylonian kings. So this is not the first time this has happened. But I want to argue, I think things are different today than previously. I want to try to give you some explanations for that. I also want to say that I'm going to approach this problem from the perspective of information economics. A lot of this will come, will interact with free speech law. I give you full warning, I do not know free speech law. So I'm going to invite your criticisms and your input on First Amendment questions and issues, because uh, I think they affect a lot what is said, how it's said, and who uh, has the rights to say things. The one punchline I want to try to give you up front is I'm increasingly of the opinion that we can, in fact, reduce the total amount of misinformation distributed in our ecosystem with no censorship at all and no central party judging truth. Uh, and I think if we can do that, then we can actually solve a lot of the different problems. What I'm going to present is two different sets of ideas. One is a theory of how this could work, and the second is a bit of evidence that maybe it can work, I'm trying to run some social media examples. The theories that we're going to use are one that should be well recognized uh, for everyone. For, you know, of course, what we've been using for ages is the marketplace of ideas dating all the way back to 1919. The best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market from Sir Oliver, or sorry, from Oliver Wendell Holmes. You know, so that's the framework that we'd like to be using. I want to explain what's happening and what's not happening here. If we take a look, I like this particular economist cartoon. So this is the current marketplace of ideas, which is today's specials are brazen lies, hate speech, propaganda, codswalla, poppycock, blarney, and drivel as what's happening going on in the marketplace, or at least that's the uh, description of it. But there's a lot of different problems going on. If we take a look at what happened you know, um, in the World Economic Forum just this year, listed misinformation as the world's greatest problem over the next couple of years even ahead of global warming. Global warming doesn't pass it for a couple of years. Interestingly enough, the third is social polarization, uh, which probably is related to the misinformation problem. So they're inter interestingly intertwined. It seems to be a big issue. And this is a big problem. Social media has been implicated in US insurrection based on false claims of election fraud. We're seeing more of that again today. In Brazil, same thing, a year later. In Brazilian insurrection based on false claims of election fraud. UK riots based on false claims of immigrants stabbing children. The stabbing actually happened, but it was a UK citizen. It wasn't an immigrant. Um, or the Rohingya massacre based on false claims of a Muslim takeover is what's happening uh, in, uh, in society. And this, isn't, um, this is kind of ubiquitous in here. Uh, the CEO of Telegram, Pavel Durov, was just arrested in France for sex trafficking, money laundering, um, and then uh, engaging in or enabling criminal activity. Brazil, Brazil just banned ex-Twitter because of lack of compliance, because of judicial interference, because of uh, lack of turning over the accounts of people that were engaging uh, in criminal activity. Social media have been implicated in insurrection, riots, lynching, money laundering, suicide, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, child exploitation, judicial intimidation, terrorist recruiting. I love this question that Yuval Noah Harari has asked. 
If social media are bringing us all together, why is everyone so angry? And it's not just a US problem. It's in Europe, it's in Latin America, it's in, you know, it's across the globe. It's a really interesting problem. And it's reached the Supreme Court. So for those of you who are doing free speech jurisprudence, there's a lot going on here. So many of you will have heard of the Gonzalez v. Google and Twitter v. Temna cases, both of them based largely on a similar set of facts, where ISIS terrorists shot up um, places in uh, Paris and in Istanbul, killing uh, Nahomi Gaz, uh, Galez and Nawrez al-Assaf. And uh, suit was bought, brought um, in the US courts for helping recruit members plan terrorist attacks resulting in multiple Paris shootings and death, uh, both in uh, Europe and in, uh, in Turkey. Um, it's interesting, on the flip side, there's also, so that was trying to pull speech back a bit. On the flip side are these other pair of cases uh, before the Supreme Court, Net Choice v. Paxton and Moody v. Net Choice, where Texas and Florida introduced laws in order to reduce discrimination against conservative voices. Uh, this was after Trump got deplatformed last time. Or they have felt that the conservative speech has been suppressed on the platform. So we'll come back to give examples of that. What's interesting is that the Supreme Court, as for the most part, sided with the platforms. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting also, liberals are unhappy on the bottom part because they want to remove more speech. And conservatives are unhappy on the top part because they feel too much speech is being removed. A little bit of a paradox. How are we going to resolve that? How are we going to balance those interests? It's a hard problem. Uh, on the one hand, is it possible to gauge 500 million messages per day and let nothing through? And if we hold platforms accountable, would it chill speech? At the same time, um, what constitutes viewpoint discrimination? Is it liberal versus conservative? Is it pro-ISIS recruiting? Is it Putin speaking to American audience? He doesn't have voting rights in the United States. Well, what if you juxtapose it to a US citizen who's espousing Putin propaganda? Is that going to be something that we can deal with? Um, and does anyone want a social media platform with no content moderation? Or could anyone avoid sanctions simply by running for office or pretending to be a journalistic enterprise under the Florida law? And should it be the case that platforms have no recourse, no matter how many times or blatantly, Folks violate the terms of service. How do we handle that? Also interesting problem. The top half is publisher rights, and the pub platforms argue they're publishers into those cases. In the bottom half, they argue, well, they're not publishers. So they're arguing both sides of that. Again, paradoxically, how are we going to handle these things and make them accountable? This is a summary of, and this article came out um, in science, or sorry, Nature Human Behavior just this past May, and it's a summary of all the different techniques for intervening and misinformation. And it shows the size of the number of experiments run on this, whether it's accuracy prompts, debunking, friction, inoculation, media literacy, social norms, warning, fact checking, labels. This is the set of all of them. I'm going to contend none of them work effectively. If I summarize all of them, here's a list of them so you can do, re read them a little bit more easily. But if you look across the bottom, I think all of these interventions, this is why the problems are so bad today or suffer from at least one, if not all, of the four following problems. So at the bottom is the arms race. If you're using a technology such as deep fakes to avoid detection, well then you can use other technology to try to detect it, and that's just an arms race. One or the other is always trying to win on, on uh, the trade-off. The second is discrediting the raider problem. If the original party is going to lie in the first place, well they can lie about the person who's fact-checking them and simply try to delegitimize them. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing such attacks on science, such attacks on academia, such attacks even on religious institutions, and certainly on political institutions. So they suffer from the discrediting the raider problem. The third is most interventions, in my view, put the responsibility on the wrong foot. That is the let the reader decide in the marketplace of ideas or the platform. But who knows whether they're lying or not better than the author of the lie. So as an intervention would be superior they would put responsibility on the content creator. Is there a way to do that? And the last one, not a single solution I'm aware of addresses this problem. It is cheaper to make stuff up than do honest journalism. The economics favor fake news over honest content creation or truth. So how do we address those things? Those are the different problems that are out there. We can't solve a problem if we can't define it. So the first thing I want to do is to give you my definition of what I think the problem is. And I don't 
think it's truth or falsity. I don't think it's the fakeness alone that matters. To give you the first example of this, there's plenty of fake stuff that just doesn't matter. Is Pluto a planet or an asteroid? It's not going to change your lives. Another one, was a favorite, I had a favorite restaurant, which is Jay's, which is down in Davis Square. The slogan was, eat at Jay's and live forever. They didn't survive COVID, so that's clearly not correct. <laughs> right? Their number interesting enough. And really simple, fake news that's disbelieved just doesn't matter. It doesn't affect anything. Irony and parody can be fake news that improve your decision making. Flip it. There are folks, that, and any vaxxers might have said, true statements. Colin Powell got the vaccine and still died of COVID. That's completely true. They neglect the fact that he also had blood cancer and nothing would have saved him at that point. Or, um, you know, they said, uh, you know, someone other died after the vaccine. And what they do is they give you two facts to create a lie by omitting a third. So it's partial truth in there. Also, if you disbelieve true information, that can matter. You can make bad judgments. So I'm arguing it's not that alone. And also, think of this as a legal or economic matter or a mechanism design question. You can't be dispossessed of truth. You can't be liable for truth or not. That's not a good point of intervention. So, what, so it's a bad focus of law. So I'm going to argue that the problem is either decision error, where it causes you to do something you wouldn't have otherwise done, or externality. And externality is the really important component of it. And externality, of course, is damage that affects a third party. Let me give you a bunch of simple examples, OK? First of these is the shooting in the pizza parlor, right? when they thought that there was a pedophile ring being run there, or clickbait, where folks are actually saying there were clear worms in the sunny water. There never were, but Coca-Cola had to issue a statement and FDA had to issue a statement that that wasn't the case. Or Salman Rushdie was attacked on the basis of videos by someone who'd never even read his work, and he lost an eye because of it. Or if you take other examples, let's see if we go forward. I'm not sure why that's not advancing. Shelby, can you advance that? That's not going anywhere. There are a couple of other examples. So the insurrection is another example of this, based on misinformation. Um, as another, have, I, they've been moving the screen around. Maybe you've actually put it in the background. I know they're trying to cover the bottom. So let's see if that makes a difference. There we go. OK, so loss of herd immunity is another one uh, from an externality perspective. Um, global warming decisions are another problem as a result of externalities. Or the insurrections are another one, OK? Here's where it gets interesting, going back to the quote from Holmes. Externalities are market failures, by definition in economic terms. Market failures require intervention, but intervention in speech is forbidden by the First Amendment. That is a problem. What does this mean? This gives us, in my view, both explanation for why things are so bad now, but also possibly means of correction. This gives another point of leverage or intervention that we haven't yet tried. So why is it so bad now as opposed to Babylonian times or 50 years ago? Now, everyone's a producer of information under social media. But under Section 230, no one is responsible. So we're getting more pollution. In effect, people are not internalizing externality harms and reproduction is overproduction of misinformation as an explanation. The second point is there's too little correction. Attempts by courts to use the marketplace of ideas to sort things out will necessarily fail. Markets don't self-correct market failures. We need other terms. And that's my view of why the problem is so hard. So let's see if we can go after that. Let's see if we can go after the marketplace of ideas. OK, it goes after this Holmesian notion. Can we repair the market, if you will? Have any of you heard of the first fundamental welfare theorem of economics? I'm not assuming that you would have. OK. How about another one? How about Adam Smith's ideas of the invisible hand? Let me see your hands there. OK, all the hands are up. Perfect. That's the intuition that we need. OK, the idea from all the way back to Adam Smith is, right, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we can expect our dinner, but the regard to their own self-interest. The idea also is this, given a Nobel Prize to von Hayek, that decentralized economies like US, UK, Japan, West Germany, create more social value than centralized economies like North Korea, East Germany, or Soviet Russia. Why? The decentralized choices of buyers and suppliers reach a social optimum in a way that a central planner 
doesn't. So the insight is you may be able to, if you can get to a marketplace where you get the parties involved to negotiate their way to a healthy outcome, it should be better than if the government tells them what to do. The first fundamental welfare theorem of economics is nothing but a mathematical proof that that's true, that the actions of buyers and suppliers will give you the social optimum. But there's a really interesting problem. It fails when there are externalities. It breaks down. It also breaks down in the case of information asymmetries. We can correct both of those. But I really want to focus on is the externalities case. How do we correct externalities? If you've been taking the economics, there are basically only two ways that we know of. The first is by Arthur Pigou. What you do in that context is you tax the factory that's producing effluent. The central government says, OK, either you can't produce more than a given quota, or if you do, then we're going to actually charge you so that you internalize and get the true social costs of what you're producing. You can't do that with speech. Government can't tax speech. A central authority isn't going to work. The only other set of ideas we know are actually due to Ronald Coase. It's this really interesting set of ideas on property rights in a missing market of harms. So could you get a property right in clean air, a property right in clean water, in a way that those get traded to actually move you towards social efficiency? If you can do that, you may be able to restore the decentralized efficient market with no central planner. That's the insight. This is the theory. Okay. Just to give you a further illustration, just to clarify the idea. So at the time he developed these ideas, radio was just being introduced, and what would happen? One radio station would increase its signal to reach the city. Then the next set would increase their uh, signal to reach the city. Then it would increase the first would increase their signal, and the second would increase their signal. And you just get radio noise and interference. What did he do? He hit on the idea of property rights, where the government says, OK, you, um, we're going to put up a license, and anyone who's got the highest value use case can buy the rights. And if another use case comes along, they can buy the rights from the first party. So it's not the case that the government is saying, you can produce and you cannot. It simply says, here are the rights, and the better party gets to buy them. Another version of the same thing, we're seeing that in cap and trade. It's being applied in that context. Another one that all of you will recognize is intellectual property rights. That's a positive externality. He invents something of incredible value. Well, I could steal it without his property right and copyright or patent. And that allows trade in the idea. So it's not the case the government says, you invent and you don't. Somebody, the inventor then gets the monopoly, which they can then trade. Importantly, notice he didn't invent property rights. He simply provides a deeper theory of how to handle externalities, whether they are positive externalities or negative externalities. The assignment of property rights helps to solve the problem. So again, government's role is not to tell you the levels of production. It's to assign rights in order that they can be traded in the marketplace of ideas. OK. Here's the challenge. How on earth are we going to solve for property rights in a missing market based on a social cost whose essential nature is misleading intangible information? Any ideas? That's what, having reframed the problem, can you see a solution? Here's a hint. What is the scarce resource? In the original, it's clean water, clean air. What is the scarce resource? Anyone want to guess? Broadband. What? Broadband? Ah, you're onto something. It's not broadband. Bingo. Say, say it again. Attention. attention. Thank you. Yes, attention is the scarce resource. OK? What information consumes is obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Now, you're doing well. How are we going to assign property rights and attention in order to make this work? That's the next stepping stone. OK? Here's my proposal as a way to actually try to make this work. OK? Fundamental attention rights information. So what we need to do is we need to assign listeners' rights and speakers' rights in attention. Any marketplace has to have the buyer and the seller, each with balancing rights, in order that they can be traded, if you will. All right. So listeners' right and the individual right to focus your attention on preferred sources of information based on criteria of your own choosing. This right to focus one's choice asserts an equal right not to choose, the right to hear and not to hear. 
Anyone see an obvious problem with this? It, this can work, but anyone see an, an, a conclusion, right, consequence of granting this right? Yes, you're batting a thousand. You're doing well. Yes, right? An exercise leads to balkanization and filter bubbles as choose to hear only what they want to hear. So that is the possible consequence of that. Now let's flip it and let's see what the speaker's right should be. By the way, I want to ask you before I get here, under the US First Amendment, which is the strongest protection in the world, do any of you have a right to be heard? Someone in the back shaking your head, no, which is correct. You have a right to speak. You do not have a right to be heard. All right, let's go there. A speaker's right is an individual expressive right to influence decisions that affect you, a right to counter disagreeable speech with agreeable speech. To influence decisions entails re receiving attention, i.e. being heard. If, by the way, this also has the flip side problem. Free exercise can be lying and signal jamming as people seek to misuse others' attention for private gain, for private advantage. So you can misuse either of these rights in either direction. Now, here's the problem. Yes, question. Didn't, didn't the, um, what was it, the neutral, net neutrality case kind of just refer to this when they were trying to throttle internet traffic in order to segment and prioritize who's I wouldn't think it's the same thing. So that's kind of, the, that's, making packets equal for sources and decision, eluding price discrimination, as opposed to this question of whether you individually can require him to hear your particular message. Not the same, not quite the same thing. So they were trying to make packets equal, but that in and of itself would not guarantee that any particular packet reached the destination you needed it to reach or that it received the attention that you as a speaker needed it to receive. Not quite the same. Marshall, do you mind just repeating that question for the Zoom audience? Oh, for the Zoom audience, was that um, did net neutrality attempt to achieve, to achieve something similar? And my argument was no, it tried to achieve some equality between packets, but without guaranteeing that it received tent attention at the, at, the, uh, at the other destination. Okay. This, however, the right to hear, oh, sorry, the right not to hear and the right to be heard need to be balanced. How do you balance those rights? An idea according to Coase is you get to one right, right effectively dominates another right on condition you exercise that right responsibly. You need to accept liability for misuse of that right. How would we do that? This is my proposal, okay? I'm combining ideas from Spence, from uh, signaling and screening from information economics with ideas of externalities and trade in decision rights from Coase. Okay, so here's how it would work. Speakers have an arbitrary right of free expression, but if you're seeking the attention over listener objection, they don't want to hear you, you need a new privilege that you don't currently have. This privilege is you gain the right to have factual claims heard by warranting content is valid. Namely, it's not illegal and is not materially false. The implementation would look something like the following. It's a time-limited escrow any resource placed, placed um, at risk, social capital, financial capital, simply points, right? I don't know if you've seen it, points on Stack Overflow or neighbor other place. Um, anyone can challenge simply by paying the peer adjudication costs, so it's economically self-sustaining and you're not motivated to issue false challenges in there. Opinions can't be warranted because you can't verify them, so you can't impose them on other people uh, without their consent. And it gives two entitlements. Entitlement number one is the speaker's right to have true claims heard subject to liability if you're wrong. It's also a listener right to be free of pollution, to be free of false claims subject to liability protection if they're misrepresented. We already have this in various forms. It's advertising, but it's refundable if it's true. All this is, is better than ads. It's credible, refundable reach. It allows you to pierce a filter bubble with a mechanism of this sort. Paul, question. Uh, seems like there's one, yep. seems like there's a missing parameter of how loud and how long the message is. 
Exactly correct. Can I get to do this for 24 hours at very high decibels, or? So you're so you've you've so the, the question again for the audience was, isn't there a scaling parameter? This is absolutely correct, and it's actually on the slide, and it appears to coast. It scales with the size of the externality. So if you are re the pollution costs have to be borne by the source. The pollution costs rise with the size of the audience. So if you're reaching 50 people, it's different than you're reaching 50,000 people. Right, so you exact, almost like an ad where you actually need to increase the size of the escrow for, uh, for the larger audience, for the la larger potential damage that you would, might be causing if misrepresenting the claim. It's not, it's not the number of people, it's duration and volume of the message. So um, th this goes to the implementation cut. I'd like to, I'd like to defer the specifics of an implementation until later. So I want to focus first on the theory, and then second, the, sp the specifics of how we might actually do it, and what, would I, what that would actually look like. So I'm going to separate those two things. There are too many other ideas I want to get through before we get into the, the minutia of, of exactly what, would, what that might entail. Um, notice, I want to actually think, one of the canons that everyone will have heard, you can't falsely, sh you don't have a First Amendment right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater so as to cause a panic. This would actually give you that right. Nothing could be more libertarian, but it's only in exchange for accepting liability for the damages. Notice it also overturns what is often said in Silicon Valley, you have a right to speech, but not to reach. In a sense, this addresses that point in that if you're going to reach farther, then you're going to be more exposed. I, this gives you the right to be heard, but only on condition accepting liability for uh, what you state. And again, notice again, this is only for people that did not want to hear you. You don't have to do any of this for the audience that's already following you. The listeners have already wanted that. So what I want to do now is I want to give you some of the evidence on this. So this is, that's the theory. So I want to distinguish between two different portions of it. Now we're going to get into a little bit of uh, experimental representation to give you some data on it. So we actually ran some experiments on uh, for your social media users to see whether or not this might actually have any impact. So I want to go through some of the study, what's that? So it's truth is more the impact of self-certification on misinformation. I have a great team of folks, uh, a couple of PhD students, if any of you are hiring, one of them is on the market this year. So Aaron uh, Nichols uh, is looking for employment. Uh, very good, okay? So here's the study testing the theory. All right, we had uh, almost 1,500 users, 1,490 social media users. Um, they're distributed across men, women, and other. Um, they're Democratic, independent, uh, Republican affiliations. Uh, and then they had to test, pass attention checks. And the test was effectively the following. So these were 20 pre-tested headlines distributed across boring, interesting, true, and false. Uh, so we knew the ground truth before using any of them. All right? So here are the, um, here's the condition. So this would be a story. This would be the headline under the story, and then you're asked a question. If you saw this article on social media, what would you choose to do with it? And your options in the control condition are not share or share. So not share or share. And it's motivated, it's set up to motivate exactly like social media. So you could get thumbs up and likes in social media. Here, if it's, if it's interesting, you're going to get uh, a nickel. And if it's boring, you're going to get penalized a nickel in here. All right? So it's set, set up to be like social media. The first control then is um, you have the option to warrant it with no stake in it. It doesn't pay any difference whether it's true or not. It's just you're putting your word against it. And then you've got this third option, exactly the same as before, not share, share, or warrant as true and share, meaning you're just taking your reputation. There's no change in your payoff. So whether it's true or false, you're still getting penalized for a boring article, and you're still getting rewarded for an interesting article. That's the costless condition. Now we're adding a dime to it. So you now have the exact same options in the costly warranting condition, such that you have the options to not share or share exactly as on social media. So you don't have to use this option at all. In this condition, if you warrant and share, um, you could still use the, the, the share under the standard one, in which case you get the same payoff as before. But if you warrant to share, in this case, boring articles, anything that's true gets a minimum of five cents or up to 15 if it's true and interesting. If it's false, so we basically just added 10 to this condition, okay? So this is now all positive and this is now all negative. So if you're um, warranting an, in, a, um, 
Uh, false and boring story, it's bigger penalty than if you're warranting a false and interesting story in here. Okay, so here's what we found in the various conditions. Uh, so yellow is false, blue is true, and this is the control condition. And surprise, surprise, just as you expect in social media, people share more false information than true information. That's, that simply agrees with the literature and what other folks have found. Okay, what's interesting is that under the costless warranting condition, there's a significant increase in actually sharing truth, but there's no reduction in the sharing of falsity. Interesting enough. So basically, they're sharing, sharing interesting stuff, or they might want to certify some of the true stuff um, in there. So simply giving them that option to self-certify actually improves the sharing of true information. But now if we introduce the, the option, it's not a requirement, simply the option of costly self-certification, now there is a significant increase in the sharing of truth relative to the um, first condition and the control condition, and it even improves relative to the costless condition. Notice there's a significant reduction in the sharing of falsity. Again, simply by providing the option. You could have all the options you previously had, and now you've got a new one on top of that. It's actually giving folks more options. One thing that surprised us is that engagement actually went up. The total amount of sharing increased, not decreased. I expected it was going to go down given possible friction. It did not. It actually rose. Um, so a significant decrease in sharing of falsity. So that's the willingness to share. That's the speaker side. What does it do to listeners? On the flip side, well, we ran this experiment again with a different group of social media users. Again, we had 2,000 in this case, and again, distributed over uh, male, female, and other. Again, distributed over a Democrat, Independent, Republican, uh, passing the attention checks. And so here's what we got across these. And now this is what you would see under the different conditions. One is the control with no label at all. The second is you simply know that it was shared by other social media users. The third is the two conditions. There's the costless sharing with warrant and the costly sharing with warrant. And then they're simply asked, to the best of your knowledge, how accurate is the claim in the above headline on a seven point Likert scale from not at all to completely accurate? Okay, so those are the, again what they're going to see. Here are the perceptions on the other side, the signaling value, if you will, of what we found. So first of all, there's good news. Well, sure enough, the perceptions actually work. So they typically, remember on a Likert scale, above four was accurate, below four was inaccurate. So lo and behold, on the control condition, folks figured out what was accurate and what was inaccurate. So that was good news. <coughs> the sharing condition, no effect. Simply learning that other people had shared it didn't increase, did not decrease belief in its accuracy. The, Adding your own reputation to it and the costless condition actually did, in, this was the signal. People did perceive it as more accurate in this case. If we introduce the costly condition, it was even more accurate. Again, not just relative to the control condition, but also relative even to the costless condition in here. Notice, by the way, in a seven point Likert scale, uh, 5.4 to five is almost a half point. That's a pretty big boost, actually, in how the perception of accuracy changed. One nuance we didn't anticipate, but made sense in hindsight, false information was also perceived as more accurate when it got warranted, right? That, which was kind of interesting. So if you warranted false and you staked your reputation on it, again, it could be challenged. You weren't testing the challenge portion of it, but it actually did mean that it, the signal value made it be perceived as more accurate uh, overall. Okay, what does this do? It gives listeners the right to be pollution free, to choose attention filters, if you will. So you could actually then choose to be, and you say, I don't want to hear this other stuff. You get to choose the filters that you want. Anyone can post what they want, but it may not necessarily reach your news feed because it's your choice, okay? Speakers can always be heard, conditional on accepting responsibility for what you say. This gives you the right to pierce a filter bubble. Maybe someone doesn't want to hear it, but now I'll give you the right to pierce that filter bubble, conditional on accepting liability for, um, for making false claims. This addresses a conservative uh, concern over censorship, and it addresses the liberal concern over harm. There is no central authority judging truth, and the spread of misinformation declines substantially. The discernment, that is, the ratio of 
true information shared relative to false information shared improves in this mechanism as good as any other mechanism I'm aware of. So that show the it, a lot of mechanisms will introduce friction on both. So yes, the false information will share, but then also, such as media literacy changing, folks actually tend to disbelieve the true information, not just the false information. So it shifts them down disproportionately, but both go down. In this one, truth goes up, falsity goes down. It's interesting and, and hopefully differential. Two other points on this. Oh, so a lot of the question is, okay, do we need the Supreme Court to step in? What about jury efficiency in this case? Well, it should be incredibly efficient. I don't know how many of you know, but this stuff is, peer juries are already being widely used in China. Why? Because the judicial system isn't very good. Platforms have stepped in and allowed sampling. So Taobao is using you know, over 2 million assessors already to decide 2.6 million cases. Meituan's a Chinese food delivery uh, uh, app, and it uses peer juries to adjudicate such simple things as, did your order leave out the rice, or did you unfairly rate the restaurant? Um, Reddit has a version of, anyone knows what AITA is on Reddit? Yeah, well, you want to say what that one is? Yes, exactly. It's, it's, the peer group, it's the peer version of that. All right, folks love going and approving that and are actually happy to do it. The point is really simple. If these systems can handle missing rice, they can handle missing ballots, right? This is already easy to scale. It's already extremely cheap uh, to do something like that. All right. What I now want to do is I want to give you an example of how it might work in practice, just as an illustration. How many of you have heard of the Hunter Biden laptop story? I see most hands go up. Wonderful. All right. I'm not going to take a position on whether those facts are true or false. What I want to do is give you the intellectual exercise of what happens if they're true and what happens if they're false. All right. So let me give you the background of the story, and then we'll trace down the different uh, leaves of this decision tray. So the background is somebody presenting as Hunter Biden shows up with three water damage laptops in his home state of Wilmington, Delaware, to a computer repair shop where the owner is legally blind. He can't tell if this is Hunter Biden or not. And the party never shows up to reclaim the laptop. So they become the property of the computer repairman who, oh, by the way, happens to be a Trump supporter and right wing radio aficionado. So he says, hmm, there's incriminating self pornography for Hunter Biden. There's Ukrainian email and there's drug use on here. I'm going to get this over to Steve Bannon in the New York Post, which he does. New York Post uh, publishes a story on it, which is then suppressed on Twitter and Facebook as possible Russian disinformation campaign prior to the election. Elon Musk then buys Twitter and releases the Twitter files as evidence of conservative suppression of conservative voices. That's the context. OK, watch what happens if we use the mechanism that's proposed, the Spence Coast marketplace mechanism. So the first step is, will Bannon or Giuliani or the New York Post or random Twitter user warrant the legality and veracity of the story? As a side note, one of the authors on that story did not include his byline because he thought it might be Russian disinformation. So he wasn't willing to include his own byline and had to put someone else on there. But what happens in that case? Suppose they're not willing to, to vouchsafe the validity of the story. Really simple. Every subscriber to New York Post is going to get it. Breitbart's going to get it. Fox News is going to get it. Their listener rights, because they've chosen to subscribe, has zero friction on the dissemination of that news. OK? But news moderators and social media are free to reject or to amplify on their own choice. So Facebook and Twitter, by their own right, because it has not been vouchsafed, could suppress it. No problem. Now flip it. Let's suppose that they are willing to vouchsafe the story. Then New York Post can own the libs. Under this case, it's going to reach Breitbart and Fox and New York Post. But then it's also going to reach Facebook and Twitter and other users by piercing that filter. Anybody can challenge it. Now what happens? Unwarranted content reaches any listener who wanted it. There's no friction on that. Refusal to warrant signals they're not confident in this legality or its accuracy. It puts the burden back on the content creator, the source. Are you willing to vouchsafe the content? New York Post can't complain of suppression if they're not willing to vouchsafe the validity of the story. 
Others are free to not carry it. And here's what's really fun. Suppose they do warrant the story, and Hunter Biden doesn't challenge it. Then it's probably true. Why? The single best party with information is Hunter Biden. The point of this mechanism is it's intended to surface the information from whatever point has the best information to create contestation of diverse antagonistic sources. No suppression of information, no censorship whatsoever, but adjudication and resolution of that sort. Question in the back. Aren't you then assuming that the interested parties are going to get access to that information? You, and like, how do you, how can you guarantee that this Biden's a bad example in this one because this is it's very public. So the beautiful thing about a marketplace is consider the following: suppose that you're a firm and you're lying about the uh, the properties of your product. You could tell your cousin the, of that because you don't want to expose yourself as an individual. You tell your cousin that information, and they could challenge the warrant. The beauty is anyone who has the private information could transfer it to someone else who could then issue the challenge uh, in that kind of a marketplace. Now, in the case of Hunter Biden, of course, it's completely public. But this creates a mechanism where it's feasible for the information to travel across links in order that it comes back for the challenge. Notice, by design, it's intended to try to motivate a challenge from whatever party might have that information or to share it in that way. So I don't assume that we'll always get there. Um, but there are mechanisms by which it might possibly get there. OK. Um, what about the business model? What about the business model, comparing what's going on? All right, well, I'll, one thing that could be fun as a starting point is consider what's going on with Twitter. So if we look at the, uh, the, date, uh, the data today with X Twitter, um, New York Times said, you know, they may lose up to $75 million as more advertisers pull out. This was before he had actually chosen to sue the advertisers, so it may be the case that even more are pulling out. Uh, so he did sue them. Uh, and um, as of September, Social Media Today was saying uh, Twitter X has already lost 20% of its US market and 30% of its UK market in the past year. They lost even more than that in Brazil after they got blocked and everyone was jumping over to Blue Sky and Mastodon and others. So if you look what's happening there, what would this mechanism do for someone like uh, X Twitter? Well, first thing is, if users can choose any filter they want, as opposed to the one that Musk is choosing for them, then you can choose Breitbart, or Fox, or Disney, or NBC, or anyone that you want. That's your listener's right to gain the information channels that you respect. What advertisers rejoice. If you want to sell guns, you go to the Breitbart filter. If you want to sell toys, you go to the Disney filter. Users self-segment automatically on your behalf, making it really easy to sustain a diverse ecosystem with different business models, all on the same infrastructure. Content moderation moves from a costly political headache, or Elon Musk making the decisions, to a decentralized system where it's effectively individual choices of speakers and listeners based on what they're willing to certify to pierce filters or not certify, so it just stays within their own particular ecosystem. And then Musk has been trying to get a payment system on there. This would give it to him automatically if he wanted, whether it's points, social capital, or whatever. But it makes it really simple to actually do that. Another question that comes up is, well, aren't Mastodon and Blue Sky doing this already? No, they're not. They're only enacting part of it. They're enacting the listener filters, which is closer to the listener right that we've articulated. But what they're not doing is they're giving the speaker's right, which allows you to be heard even by someone that doesn't want to hear you. In order to get a complete solution to the externality problem, we need COSA's balancing rights. We need rights for speakers and for listeners in such a way that they can be traded so that you can actually get both sides. So that would be the complete solution as opposed to half solution. A half solution won't solve the problem. It won't act, it'll create Depending on what you're doing, it's not actually going to clean the marketplace uh, in there. It's not actually going to allow folks to be heard or create or pierce some of the, the filter bubbles in it overall. Okay, so what does this do? Self-certification provides a credible signal that the author believes their claims are true. Nobody knows better than the content creator whether or not that content created is accurate. 
So what this does is it separates out the stuff that they're willing to vouchsafe is accurate. So it helps to remove the clutter from that marketplace of ideas. If we go back to that set of four problems I articulated at the beginning as to why none of the other solutions are really addressing the problem, this actually helps with all of them. Notice one of them is that it's now cheaper, to be honest, than to tell lies. If you want other people to hear you, because you can't pierce their filter bubble if you're not willing to vouchsafe, but that means you're not willing to accept the liability on that. So it's now cheaper to tell the truth. Um, so it changes the cross structure. It's a very credible signal of the validity of the source. And we showed empirically that people believe it, as they should, because it's a costly signal. It, human behavior solves the arms race problem. This is a mechanism design problem. It's not going to be a deep fake arms race. So you know you're creating the deep fake or not. Are you willing to certify it's not a deep fake? It's going to get costly, where the experts can actually challenge you. It internalizes the externalities. If you're Coca-Cola and someone else certified the claim that your uh, water has worms in it, you can actually force them to bear the cost, right? If you are um, you know, Hunter Biden and someone's lying about you, you could force them to bear the cost, to transfer the value. That's the, that's the exchange that should happen. So it internalizes externalities. It creates the discovery of distributed private information in a marketplace almost wherever it is. Not guaranteed, but it motivates differentiated parties to speak up. It protects whistleblowers. Why? Because all you have to do is to vouchsafe the claim. You don't have to self-identify. You simply back up the claim with evidence. At the same time, it's harder to issue false statements because you can't back them up. So it actually helps to protect anonymity, even at the same time, um, it doesn't necessarily enable false claims about others' reputations. Um, so it also solves the discrediting the rater problem because you're not going to have to discredit peer juries, systems that we're using in all other kinds of systems uh, out there. And notice of all, most importantly, no content whatsoever is censored at any point in this chain. And there is no central authority judging truth. No one. It is completely decentralized. So. Um, that's the set of ideas. So I welcome any discussion, any feedback on either first the theory as to whether this could actually work. And then also we can go into the, now would be the time we can go into the implementation details, whether you not think this or that nuance would actually be better. I'm interested in the harshest criticisms you guys have in order that we can get better ideas than the ones that I have. Okay, so here's, the, here's the, the question, here's your opportunity. So dig into the theory, dig into the empirics. I, I'd love to hear more, uh, any thoughts, any questions. Great, thank you so much, Marshall. Um, I'll start with a question that's popped up on the Zoom chat um, in regard to the idea of liability here, mm -hmm. and how would you calculate liability for a false claim? So. My argument is, um, and this is, a, this is a great implementation question. So my preference is that you would only use something analogous to statutory harms or parametric insurance. An example is you pay a certain amount for $50,000 in life insurance. The person lives or dies, you get the 50,000. You're not actually calculating how many kids did they have? Did they have a higher low quality profession? That sort of thing. My argument is that we're trying to keep the transactions cost as low as possible so that you wouldn't have to do that step. Now, maybe there are implementations that would do that step, but all I'm trying to do is to use, say, a parametric insurance so that in expectation, the externalities are of a certain size, and so the trigger is extremely easy. Did they lie? Did they not lie? Or did they lie in a fractional amount? So you don't actually have to get to the stage of assessing the sizes of the harms to reduce the transactions cost. But there could be other implementations that do that. OK? Other questions? Let's see. Um, in the case of Taobao, there's like a dual incentive for there to be peer juries and situations for them to moderate because uh, you know a disagreement could result in lost value for both customers and the provider Taobao. But in the case of social media, it seems like there's a double disincentive to do such a thing because a disagreement on social media means much more profit for the company. And it also means that the users themselves will get more engagement. How does this play out in an incentives uh, system that's much wider? So I like that question. Um, 
Uh, let me give you two answers. My first answer is I think this solves Elon Musk's current problem because he's losing users badly because they don't like, um, advertisers don't like what's happening and folks don't like that they're losing the ability to influence the folks that they want to reach their own audiences. So that, that's one where I think in that specific case, he ought to be motivated to adopt it because I think this would be a better position than he's currently in. You raise a very good point, however, that in some cases, um, the controversy alone is a good thing. And this might be the case where we would need legislation to grant you speakers' rights and grant you listeners' rights. The system works at either level. If the platform, the platform could simply intervene and, and give you those rights right now. So Blue Sky could give you those rights right now. Mastodon, Twitter could give you those rights right now. If they refuse to do so, that's where legislation plays out. And legislators in the United States, in Europe, Australia, what have you, would have to give you users' rights and speakers' rights, which would then make it happen. So you're correct, there are occasions when they would, this might contravene some of their self-interested business models where they want information pollution and controversy, which are the harms we were experiencing at the beginning of the talk. So it's possible they can introduce it at the platform level. If they don't, then we need legislation to do it to either of those two levels. So then what incentive is there for like a government to regulate this kind of thing? Oh, that I think is easy. I mean, the, the government reason for doing that is you would reduce the scale of the pollution problem dramatically. I think you would help to solve things like the insurrection problem uh, that we're experiencing in Brazil, the UK riots, uh, that we had the insurrections we had in the United States. I mean, to me, uh, you're free to disagree, but to me, it should be obvious why we need better, healthier, cleaner information ecosystems than the ones we have now. And this is a solution that's decentralized to clean it without having the government do it. But some regimes would want worse systems in place then. Totalitarian regimes might. Hi, um, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. I had a question about um, what happens then when we have people or media platforms or content creators who can actually afford um, to lose monetary value and afford this pollution because they have ulterior motives. What then? You know, um, we talked um, in a class about some lawyers who use ChatGPT and it was, it was giving false information and they were charged like $5,000 or something like that, which is not much of, you know, not much of a, a repercussion, I would say. So what happens then? Wonderful question. And I actually think this is one where this should be an advantage. Let me give you two different answers to that question. So let's compare, to rephrase the question, right? Are the indigent at a disadvantage in a system where you actually warrant liability compared to the rich who could afford to warrant the liability? So let me give you two answers. The first answer is to simply re reverse the question and ask you, if you want attention for your message now, how do you get it? My argument is, especially if you're an incoming politician, you have to have a massive budget. So at the moment, we're already heavily favoring the rich over the poor. This election was massively overspent compared to any prior election. All of this has been changing since Citizens United. So I think compared to what we have now, we're in a bad situation presently. Now, let's go back to see what the market happens. If you're telling the truth, it should be costless to you to be able to do it. Better still, what's really neat about this is if the market is pro properly functioning, you could actually go to an underwriter who had the money, pre-vet your claim and say, this is what I want to say. They could vet it on your behalf, insure it, and then you could reach anyone you want to. So you could be totally indigent. Notice it's a better moral hazard solution than even auto insurance. So once the auto company has insured you, you could drive badly after you got the insurance. Here, you'd be insuring a claim that they could pre-vet. You'd tell them what they're insuring. And then you could use the marketplace to actually underwrite it. So my argument is if the market's functioning as it should, it should help the underprivileged get honest messages out in ways that they don't have at present. So I think it actually could help address exactly the problem that you raise. Um, hi, Professor. So I'm, I'm really curious about um, what the sanctions would be for those who um, post false messages and if those sanctions would include not only sort of financial sanctions but also reputational sanctions that are posted in the social media apps so that um, when, when there are false claims 
uh, and those are warranted uh, and, and they're approved as, as false, then um, the app would post that there were certain speakers or, or that those speakers were making false claims and, and, and then um, the people who are in the social media app would know that there's this uh, person or, or organization that is publishing right. false information. Right. So a uh, couple of thoughts on that. Um, I would think that yes, whether your comments are challenged and whether one would be part of the reputation. So it would be another dimension or another degree of freedom of the reputational element. A second thought, though, is there are also instances when you would want to be able to certify anonymous claims, which would then not attach to an individual reputation, but the, the information, the background, is with the claim itself as another way to do that. A third point is, this is another way in which it actually addresses the previous question. If you keep trying to certify the same lie again and again and again, it would be the same as if you keep driving and keep having accidents. Your rates go up, which is what should happen. If you're going to lie again and again and again that you won the election and you didn't, it's going to get more and more and more and more expensive, which is what should happen in there. So I, I, that should give you a couple of different answers to that question. Again, if the market is working the way it should. So, it, hi, uh, thank you for the talk today. This is a super interesting uh, discussion. Um, this is sort of a broader question about when a warrant is challenged, how does that play out all the way to like, when you say honest information being shared, honest information going out, the question would be, eventually you have to get to some body that checks the information. Who checks the checkers in this? instance. So you're asking a broader question about what is the mechanism for adjudicating truth, okay? Uh, that is a really interesting philosophical question. The longer answer to that is actually in the first paper, free speech and the fake news problem. So if you want the full details, let me refer you to that. But let me give you an honest, what I view as an answer to that problem. So if we're completely honest about it, the fact is you can't know truth with absolute certainty. Human species thought we were the center of the universe. They thought it was geocentric. Uh, they thought the Earth was flat in there. If you know in computer science terms, you actually can't solve the halting problem, which is knowing truth to an arbitrary number of bits in there. So you can't actually know it. My view is that what you need is an adjudication mechanism, which has the fewest false positives and fewest false negatives of any mechanism. No matter what mechanism you choose, you're going to have false positives and false negatives in there. So you want the best one of those. I would argue that among those, what you should do is to choose a mechanism that balances legitimacy, which tends to oversample from peer juries, and accuracy, which tends to oversample from experts or scientific method. I don't care what the vote on the coefficient of gravity is. Anyone can use scientific instruments in a decentralized fashion to validate what that is. So I would argue figure out what you want given the type 2 on and type 2 errors, figure out how to balance acceptance, legitimacy, with accuracy composed to say jury nullification and scientific method and experts. So pick a decentralized mechanism to preserve the decentralization property and solve for those elements. Type 1, type 2 errors in legitimacy and accuracy. Okay. Thank you so All right. much. Um, so one quick thought, so any of you that are interested, the theory is in the very first paper there. This is in the free speech and fake news problem. That's up on Social Science Research Network. The evidence, the factual paper, is truth is warranted. Um, I can send you a copy of that. It's not publicly posted, but that's, that's completely done. We're submitting it to journals shortly. Any of you, those that are interested in free speech versus free ride, navigating social media, how should we update section 230? That's the third paper there. So I invite uh, any feedback on any of those things, because this is a work in progress. In all seriousness, this is a really, really hard problem. So I welcome your thoughts, your critiques, your participation. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Marshall.
Thank you all so much for joining us today and for our folks on Zoom. We hope you'll attend one of our upcoming events. We have a couple speaker series lined up for the rest of the term. Um, we also wanted to invite you all. We have a day of talks this Friday on AI governance. Um, and I'm told that there will be snacks and lunch provided as well. Uh, I believe signups you can find on the Berkman Klein Center website and we're hoping to see you all there. Thanks so much. Thank you.